Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Montgomery County Council. It is Tuesday, June 27th. There's a lot of good energy here in the chamber today. Welcome to everybody. We are going to start today with two proclamations before we go to general council business. And the first proclamation is a commemoration recognizing Pride Month for this year, 2023, that will be led by myself and the full council. And we also have County Executive Elrich here and a few youth who have participated in the youth writing competition. Uh, so I will join County Executive Elrich uh, down on the floor. We have the big proclamation here. You want to hold that one? Yep. Fantastic. Well, good morning, everybody. It is the end of June, but it's been a really wonderful month celebrating pride here throughout the county. We had a wonderful Pride in the Plaza celebration in downtown Silver Spring. We've had a number of events organized all throughout Montgomery County over the last four weeks really celebrating our diversity, celebrating love, and celebrating our beautiful families that make up our 1.1 million residents here. It is a wonderful celebration. And you know, for, for me as well, serving as the first openly LGBTQ plus council member, uh, having a new council, uh, six new council members who each bring their families, their beautiful families into the fold, um, their love and shared commitment for our community, it is a wonderful thing. And that shared commitment and that love is more important than ever. Because while we celebrate pride here in Montgomery County, there are jurisdictions and states all across the country that are doing the opposite. Over the last few months, there have been more than 520 anti-LGBTQ plus pieces of legislation introduced throughout this country. Preserving, reversing rights, shoving people back in the closet, taking away our dignity. This is not the Montgomery County way. This is not Maryland's way, which is why this celebration, this continu continued celebration and the continued laws, regulations, and policies that we pass here in Montgomery County to make sure that everybody is loved, is respected, and is seen for who they authentically are. And it's also important to note that later today, this council will be codifying and creating an anti-hate task force, further making sure that members of the LGBTQ plus community and every group here in Montgomery County feel safe, seen, and respected while living within our borders. That is who we are, and I'm glad to have a partner like County Executive Elrich in these efforts as well, and I'll turn it over to him to make a few comments. So this is, you know, an issue of great consequence. Um, you know, for centuries, People were rendered invisible. And in our own country, people were required to be invisible for a very long time. And, you know, it is good to see how rapidly the cloak of invisibility was forced to come down. But there's still people out there trying to put it back up. And we're going to have our own debate in Montgomery County, you know, in the school system. I think everybody knows that. It's like probably the elephant in the room. But, you know, the truth is that if we, if, the signature of our community is that we protect and value everybody, then everybody means everybody. And everybody who comes to us and says, you, we want you to support us and protect us and make sure we're safe there, needs to extend that courtesy to everybody else in the community, including the LGBTQ plus community. There can be no exceptions to tolerance. And you can't pick and choose who you tolerate. So we have a responsibility to, you know, do the right thing. I started, you know, I, I do these weekly messages, and this month 
uh, we started with an interview with Rich Maddalino and myself, because Rich was this amazing leader in the state legislature on the gay pride issues, and I guess before him was Sheila Hickson. And uh, so, you know, Maryland made great strides to, in gay marriage, the first place by ours, I think, <laughs> to uh, actually pass it by referendum, but it was no small thing. And so we're on a path that we're not going back from. Um, people need to be visible. Uh, they're visible anyway, so people who think if I erase them from books somehow they're not going to exist is a little bit nuts. Um, so I'm you know, proud to stand here, proud to support this community, and I want everybody to know that you, we're not wavering, we're not backing up. We know what's right, and we're going to keep doing what's right. It's the easiest thing to do. Anything else gets you into a convoluted, mind-twisting mess. Just doing what's right is pretty simple, pretty straightforward, and in this case, really clear. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, County Executive, and also extend uh, our deep appreciation for the leadership of Senator Rich Maddalena uh, for everything that you've done and continue to do for our county and our state. Uh, uh, at this point in time, I would like to invite up uh, two local high school students. Uh, part of Pride Month is youth engagement, and we want to make sure uh, that youth voices are heard. And we uh, organized an essay competition, a poem competition, and allowed students to share their thoughts regarding LGBTQ plus visibility and representation. Uh, and the two winners of that competition uh, are Rose Slade, uh, who is a rising 11th grader, 10th grader at BCC, and uh, Nikki Jang, if you want to come on up, who uh, attends Richard Montgomery as well, uh, and they're going to share with you their own thoughts, their words about representation, about diversity, and about our beautiful community. And so, Rose, we'll start with you. Good morning, everyone. I wonder if my friends can't imagine growing up. I've heard so many people talking about what representation meant to them, being able to see queer people exist, just exist, to simply see them in the world and in books. So many people say how they can't visualize their future because they've never seen someone like them have one, that when they were young and someone asked them what they wanted to be, they never knew, not because they didn't know what professions they liked, they just couldn't visualize themselves having a future. When they tried to imagine a future self, it felt like someone else, a perfectly normal life, exactly what was expected, but it didn't belong to them. It makes sense why the suicide rate is so high. It must be hard to find the motivation to continue a life when you can't even fathom growing up, when the future you're supposed to have is completely foreign. I remember an old queer person's video. I don't remember what the video was about. I remember all the people in the comments talking about how that video was the first time they'd been able to see a queer person grow old. All the creator did was exist visibly, and so many people realized that they had a future. I wonder if my friends can see themselves growing old. I never asked them about it, but I hope they can. They deserve to exist. Thank you. Here, Rose, stay up here, stay up here. Thank you for those wonderful, that wonderful uh, essay, Rose. And, and now Nikki is going to share her essay, too. Um, good morning. Have you ever imagined what it's like to be rejected by the world and not be accepted for your true self? This year, Pride Month is once again acknowledged by many as a celebratory time for everyone to reflect on the positive impacts made by the LGBTQ plus community. And as a reminder for those in the LGBTQ plus community to stand tall for who they are and to take pride in themselves as unique individuals. Despite many recognizing the LGBTQ community and its impacts. There are still those in the community who face discrimination and experience the feeling of being pushed away by others because of their differences. All people deserve to have their voices heard. And in the same way, the LGBTQ plus community deserves to have the right to represent themselves freely without restrictions on their rights. People of the LGBTQ plus community should own the right to express themselves in all aspects, including the right to being, represent themselves in a community, government, sports, books, movies, television, and more. Because everyone should be proud of their true selves without having to fear the judgment and views of others. At my school, my teachers, who are part of the LGBTQ plus community, supported my ideas and made me feel re represented. 
Ultimately, it is only through the inclusion of all sexualities and the acceptance of the LGBTQ plus community that the world can become more welcoming to those who are different while taking steps toward a more better and more accepting place. Thank you. And you can see why they're here today. Uh, and thank, I want to first also thank both of you. Um, thank all of your teachers and administrators at BCC and at Richard Montgomery and within MCPS trying to foster a community where everybody is safe, seen, and welcome. Uh, and also, I just want to thank their parents. You know, um, I want to thank you for raising children who are who want to celebrate our diversity and inclusion and share their love with everybody. So thank you very much to your parents. Um, with that, I'd love to bring my colleagues down so that we can read this proclamation together for the official Pride 2023 proclamation. Most of us are here. Um, so a proclamation from Montgomery County. Whereas June is Pride Month and 2023 marks the fifth year that Montgomery County recognizes Pride as a time to celebrate love and inclusivity. And? Whereas during Pride Month, we reflect on the progress we have made in the fight for justice, inclusion, equality, while reaffirming our commitment to do more to support lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer rights and. Whereas the meaningful contributions made by our LGBTQ plus community enhance our county's diverse history and our culture and. Whereas we recognize trailblazers of generations before us, like Marsha Johnson, who protested against police brutality after Stonewall and celebrated people like her who championed the struggle of civil rights and helped pave the path towards achieving full equality. And? Whereas we celebrate the accomplishments and victories of the LGBTQ plus community, such as the 11th anniversary of the marriage equality in Maryland, while highlighting the dangers of the Supreme Court reversing the hard-fought progress made in recent years and. Whereas we honor the, res Thank you. We honor the resilience and determination of the many individuals who are fighting to live freely and authentically. In doing so, they're opening hearts and minds and laying the foundation for a more just and equitable society. And whereas today the rights of LGBTQ plus Americans are under relentless attack, members of the LGBTQ plus community, especially people of color and trans people, continue to face discrimination and cruel, persistent efforts to undermine their human rights and Whereas Montgomery County reaffirms its commitment to support our non-binary and transgender residents, particularly black trans women, who continue, continue to face marginalization, discrimination, and violence, and? Whereas Pride is a time to recall the trials endured by the LGBTQ plus community and to rejoice in the triumphs of trailblazing individuals who have bravely fought for full equality and? Whereas, whereas the LGBTQ plus community and smaller municipalities within the county have organized parades, workshops, festivals, and many other activities to celebrate Pride Month and uplift their LGBTQ plus neighbors, and whereas everyone should be able to live without fear of prejudice, discrimination, violence, and hatred based on race, religion, gender identity, or sexual orientation, age, or disability, and Whereas, with the Progress Pride flag proudly raised in our Veterans Memorial Plaza outside the County Executive Office building, Montgomery County stands with LGBTQ plus people 
their loved ones and allies locally and across the country. Now, therefore, be it resolved that Mark Elwich is County Executive, Evan Glass is Council President, and the entire Council of Montgomery County, Maryland, hereby proclaim June 2023 as LGBTQ plus Pride Month, presented on this, this 27th day of June in the year 2023. Happy Pride, everybody. And what I would love to do, we are about to take a picture. If you are here and you want to celebrate Pride and you want to be in a picture with all of us celebrating Pride Month, we welcome you to come on down for a quick photo. So come on down, everybody. Thank you everybody for that outpouring of love and inclusion. Next we will have a proclamation recognizing Mike Riley, the director of the Montgomery Parks and the Parks Department for their award-winning natural grass fields program and that will be led by Council Member Fonnie Gonzalez and I believe County Executive Elrich as well. Green people, come. Mitra, come. Bruce, come. All the tree hoggers, you too, come here. <laughs> Don't lie. No, sorry. Um, I know, I know, I know. Come on here, guys, come, come. Don't be shy. All right, guys, I'm going to start. Good morning. See, happy people. Uh, my name is Natalie Fanny Gonzalez. I'm the council member for District 6. I'm the chair of the Economic Development Committee, and I'm a member of the Parks, Housing, uh, and Planning Committee. I am here on a very special occasion. Where's Mike? Oh, why are you doing all the way there? Come right here. <laughs> He ran away already. Um, we're here to give a special recognition to Parks Director Mike Raleigh and the team of Montgomery Parks Ta -da! for the tremendous progress on transitioning to natural grass athletic fields, not only on parkland, but also in many MCPS locations, uh, primarily elementary and middle schools. It is a model program that is providing opportunities for workforce development in addition to safer and healthier play areas 
for which the leadership of Montgomery Parks has received national recognition. Previously, as a member of the planning board, where, where I was, I worked uh, with Mike to move parks in that direction. Last fall, I attended the most recent athletic field showcase at Wheaton Regional Park, and I was very, very impressed, which demonstrated uses of the, of the latest technologies to maintain the safety and playability of athletic fields. On a personal note, um, I have always been against tire waste in playgrounds and synthetic fields, and Mike knows that very well. Um, but my youngest, Luca, was just a baby. Uh, he was one, he was in one of our playgrounds, and he touched the uh, rubber surface, and he burned himself. That's how hot he was, and that is not okay. So I've been very passionate about it since I was on the planning board, and I continue to do so here on the county council. So grass fields reduce the risk of heat, stress, and injuries. Synthetic turf fields place athletes at risk of, of heat, stress, and injuries, and that's why we shouldn't have them. So um, I'm very honor, honored to have a series of, of folks here, including Delegate Jared Salomon, who's going to provide a couple of words. Where is Jared? Oh, there you are. And uh, alongside with County Executive Mark Elrich. I'm going to start with the County Executive first before we move on. Okay. Hey, thank you so much. Um, this is really great. I mean, I remember, Mike, back in the early days of this discussion, where the big victory was we were going to build two fields side by side, one with and one without out to see how they performed. And we've come a long way from that discussion. We went from let's see how it performs to realizing we can actually do this. And you know, the arguments that we made 10 years ago, and I see a lot of my friends from those battles 10 years ago up here, are the, are the same today. The plastic is dangerous. It breaks into microplastics. It's got PFAS involved in it. Tire rubber was always dangerous. Zeolite isn't any better. It leads to respiratory issues. There is no safe way really to do artificial, and there's no environmentally sound way. Whether or not there's an immediate effect on people, there's certainly an effect on the environment. So I am really happy to see this progress. Um, someday all fields in this county will be natural, and that will be a great victory. But I think that this will help show the way that we can actually get extended playability. And the other important thing, you know, a lot of the pressure on artificial turf was created by the lack of fields. The lack of fields wasn't because Montgomery County didn't have fields. It's because so many of our fields were so bad, they weren't really playable for the community. Bringing back the elementary school fields and the middle school fields to the point they're playable extends the number of fields, which takes pressure off the artificial turf fields in the long run, and may open the door to moving us back to a more sensible policy on the artificial turf fields that remain. But Mike, I want to thank you. Uh, I'm really glad that you know everybody learned out of this experience, and you were willing to, you know, rethink where that department was going. And uh, not everybody rethinks things, and it was really helpful that you did that, and you've led us to a much better place than we were. So thank you very much for what you did. I would be remiss not to mention Debbie Spielberg, who has been in my office and probably been the most dogged um, <laughs> activist at, at this level in terms of moving the county toward artificial, away from artificial turf and toward natural grass. So I just want to acknowledge the work you've done over more than a decade on this issue. So thank you. And thank you. Jared, uh, Delegate Jared Solomon. Thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Jared Solomon. I'm a delegate in District 18, um, and it's a real pleasure to be here, represent the communities of Kensington, Chevy Chase, Wheaton, um, Silver Spring. Um, you know, we've really tried to partner at the state level. Um, actually, one of the best things we get to do every year is bring home a significant chunk of money for our parks. I think it's really, um, really, I always knew how important and special they were to the county, but as a, as a relatively new dad, we have a, a three-year-old and a, and a six-month-old. We spent a lot of time at our parks, um, and especially during COVID, I don't know what we would have done. Um, and, and as we come out of the pandemic, I think it's only heightened the importance of publicly accessible outdoor spaces for everybody. Um, and that's making sure that they are as healthy and safe as possible. Um, you know, there's a, a bill actually that our congressional delegation just introduced to honor um, the life of Jordan McNair, who is a, a player, football player at the University of Maryland who died um, after suffering heat stroke on a field that was 40 or 50 degrees over what really should have been uh, a synthetic field that was over the safe temperature. Um, and so we've done a lot of work at the state level, partnering with, with our, county, um, our county folks 
and I have to give recognition again to Senator Madaleno, who was a champion of this when he was in the state Senate. Our Lieutenant Governor, um, Lieutenant Governor Runa Miller, when she was a member of the House of Delegates, was also a champion on this. Um, and it's really incredible to once again see Montgomery County leading. Um, and it's not an easy task, um, but but it's incredibly important. And I also, on a personal note, have to thank Mike, who I know, I think you've held literally every job, I was told, in the Parks Department. Um, and uh, Mike, liter Mike is going to retire shortly. Um, and... <laughs> I, I can't I can't thank you enough um, for the work that you've done and Mike is also a neighbor in Kensington so you can come knock on my door and complain to me about things that we're not doing well um, but just thank you to you and your whole team for the work that you have done in making um, this county just an incredibly wonderful place to live we all love Mike and we have done a lot of processing in the parks department there's no way you're leaving anytime soon I just kind of put that uh, before we read the proclamation, I would like to um, uh, say thank you to the new planning board chair, Artie Harris is here. Thank you for coming, sir. Thank you. Alongside the new planning board member, Mitra, uh, who's, you know, she, she comes from the Parks Department, so she's part of the family. And I also would like to recognize uh, many of her friends in Amber, Kathy Michaels, Amanda Farber, Wendy Howard, Laura Stewart, Denise Guitarra, Sheldon Fishman, where's Sheldon? I love Sheldon, there you are. Bruce Adams and so many other people who came together uh, to celebrate Mike Riley and the amazing work that park, the, the Parks Department has done. With that, I'm gonna start reading the proclamation alongside our County Executive Mark Elrich. It's very long and I don't have my glasses. So I'm just gonna read half and then you read the other half. Because this one-on-one -on -one thing that usually happens on the County Council, I don't like it. One paragraph and then the other person has to switch. So, Montgomery County Council of, of the County Council of Montgomery County, Maryland Proclamation, whereas the Parks Department maintains natural turn grass space for diverse array of athletic opportunities, including but not limited to cricket, soccer, baseball, and softball, kickball, field hockey, football, lacrosse, rugby, and ultimately frisbee. And whereas the Parks Department serves diverse groups of recreational and competitive athletes in Montgomery County by providing equitable access to high quality athletic fields for exercise and community building opportunities. And whereas the Parks Department with resources supplied by the county and the state has embarked on aggressive program to increase the quantity and quality of athletic fields on parkland and at public schools. And whereas in the last year, the Parks Department has supported over 66,000 permits for athletic field use, accounting for nearly 220,000 hours of play, equivalent to 25 years. And whereas the Parks Department continues to improve and upgrade park fields with sustainability and climate action in mind, installing highly efficient soil moisture and irrigation systems, as well as, as selecting high efficiency lining options that are designed to provide safe, well-lit spaces that reduce energy consumption and align with the dark sky initiative to reduce light pollution and impact to migra migratory birds. And the whereas the Parks Department has made safety and playability improvements to over 40% of our 285 athletic fields in the past 10 years and good luck yep. there. Yeah. Right here. I will point out this is this is a form of a function if we're gonna have these many talking points a scroll I know. might actually <laughs> then we could have bigger print um, whereas in, in 2022 the softball field in Wheaton Regional Park one mid-atlantic sports field managers association sport turf field of the year and whereas the Parks Department conducts periodic athletic field showcases on its evolving technology and equipment dedicated to improving fields and has transitioned specific high-use fields to Bermuda grass, including at Latonia Recreation, Martin Luther King Recreation, South Germantown Recreation, Ridge Road Recreation, and Wheaton Regional Parks, which on high traffic fields provides better wear and drought resistance. And Whereas the Parks Department renovated 28 MCPS locations over a seven year period with an emphasis on underserved communities and now maintains 200 athletic fields in 105 MCPS elementary, middle, and high school locations countywide. And whereas, see the scroll use? 
Whereas the Parks Department renovated 28 MCPS, I did, I did that one. Okay, whereas the Parks Department worked with MCPS to complete stage one of the County Council funded uh, Montgomery Blair High School project, which included renovating the track field with an amendment, soil prof amended soil profile, state of the art irrigation, Bermuda grass and lighting, which will be available for community use after phase two practice field is completed. And whereas the Parks Department celebrated with the Recreation Department to provide high quality grass athletic field at White Oak Recreation Center, which serves as a highly, highly populated diverse community. And whereas the Parks Department strives to be an exemplary national leader in innovation, construction, and maintenance of premier publicly available natural grass athletic fields. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the County Council of Montgomery County, Maryland, and County Executive Mark Elvridge recognize the extraordinary works of the Parks Department and Mike Riley, Director of Montgomery Parks, for creating a nationally renowned award-winning program for installing economically, maintaining state-of-the-art grass fields presented this 27th day of June, 2023. Wow, thank you. Um, that was really wonderful and appreciated. I heard my name uh, said a lot, but uh, if you look at my fingernails, you'll see I haven't been digging in the dirt much at all lately. I've been sitting at a desk. But I brought five members of my athletic field team with me. Please raise your hand. Josh, Alicia, Marty, Galen, Sam. These, these are the experts. These are the scientists who do the actual work. They're artists. Uh, I was just out watching them do their work at our latest Bermuda grass field at Hillendale Local Park on New Hampshire Ave, uh, north of the Beltway, if you want to see a beautiful sea of green drive up New Hampshire Ave in the near future. But uh, they are experts, and the only way this program has been successful is that over the years, the county council has supported it with resources, with staffing. You can have natural grass fields that can handle a heck of a lot of use, but you have to have experts that build them right, and then you have to have experts that maintain them, and that doesn't come inexpensively. But we've proved it can be done, and I'm very excited about that. Uh, I just want to thank, again, the County Council for making the resources available. I could get so geeky and talk forever about the strains and cultivars of Bermuda grass. There's latitude, there's iron cutter. I could talk about soil moisture sensors that make sure you don't use a drop extra or a drop too little of water to irrigate. But there really is a science that it's evolving, the type of equipment we use to aerate, the type of, uh, we have verted drains, we have slit seeders, we have, uh, all kinds of fun equipment we show off at our equipment showcases. So next time we have one, come out, learn about what it takes to grow grass. At the end of the day, when our kids and our aspiring athletes come out to our school and park fields, we want grass where there's supposed to be grass. We want smooth in fields without rocks, and we don't want rainouts. If any of you have played or have children who play, you get all ready on that evening or a Saturday, and then you get to the field, and it's full of puddles. We do not want that to happen. So again, thank you for supporting us, Council. Thank you, uh, Commissioner, uh, Commissioner, excuse me, well Council Member uh, Fadi Gonzalez, who supported me both uh, on this initiative, both as a planning board. The former Fed Committee was a big champion of this. The current Planning and Housing and Parks Committee continues to support this. So thank you, thank you, thank you.
crazy. Yesterday was crazier than I expected. Okay. Thank you all for the celebrations this morning and for the all-star team that helps makes our parks department and our fields run safely, smoothly, and ecologically, right? You like that? Thank you, Kathy. <laughs> so uh, we are now going to proceed with the rest of our business. We'll start with general business, Madam Clerk. Are there any announcements? Good morning, Council President, Council Vice President, Council Members. Uh, today, Council Members Juwando and Sales will be attending the Council meeting virtually. Also, the public hearings for Agenda Items 3T, Transfer of Unexpected Project Balance within the FY24 Capital Budget, and Amendment to the FY23-28 Capital Improvements Program, Montgomery County Public Schools for multiple construction projects to MCPS local unliquidated surplus account number 999 in the amount of $3,400,000 and item 3U, transfer of unexpected project balance within the FY24 capital budget and amendment to the FY23 to 28 capital improvements program, Montgomery County Public Schools from MCPS unliquidated surplus account number 999 in the amount of $3,400,000 to multiple construction projects is scheduled for July 25th, 2023 at 1.30 p.m. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. The minutes of the June 13th Council session have been circulated to Council members. Are there any changes? Not seeing any. Those minutes are approved. We are now going to sit as the Board of Health, and we welcome Dr. Davis, our Chief Health Officer, uh, Mr. O'Donnell, our Program Administrator for Public Health Emergency Preparedness and Response, um, uh, our new Director of Health and Human Services, um, and also uh, Ms. Clemens Johnson as well. Um, and before we start with this uh, biannual update, I'm going to turn it over to the Chair of the Health and Human Services Committee, Councilmember Albert Noss. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. So these briefings are a little less dramatic than they were a couple of years ago, um, but they're just as important as they were a couple of years ago. The importance of public health, the infrastructure that we have here in our community is not by accident. Uh, it's done by incredibly dedicated public health professionals such as the ones before us today who are working tirelessly seven days a week, 24 hours a day uh, to help ensure the health and safety of all of our county residents, especially those most vulnerable. On Saturday, I had the opportunity to attend the graduation uh, along with uh, Director Bridgers of the Health Promotores Program through the Latino Health Initiative. And uh, it was a class of 21 individuals and all of them brought their families. The room was packed over in the executive office building. Mm -hmm. And you could tell that this was a calling for each of them. They are the bridge. They are among many examples of what we need more of moving forward to ensure that we connect these wonderful services that we have available, that we need more of, that we have to ensure is affordable and accessible, but connect what we have and what we will have in the future to the community that needs those services. So I'm very proud of the work of Dr. Bridgers, Dr. Davis, and uh, Mr. O'Donnell for your dedication, and please continue to express our deepest appreciation to your teams uh, for all the work that they do. Look forward to the briefing today and I've got a couple of questions, but we'll wait till after the presentation. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much, Chair Albernaz. Uh, I will turn it all over to you. I don't know if there's a slide deck that we want to start with or Dr. Bridgers, you want to kick it off. Sure. Thank you, uh, Council President Glass and the entire council sitting this morning as a Board of Health. It's been a, a while since we've had a chance to chat about the state of health in Montgomery County, and today's briefing will be less COVID-centered. However, we have some information about where we are in future planning and consideration of a virus that still looms in the community. I am grateful to have Dr. Davis uh, as our chief medical officer, our chief 
uh, a public uh, health officer and Mr. O'Donnell, we continue to do great work in the community and I look forward to their robust update. Lastly, I'd like to echo uh, HHS Chair, uh, Committee Chair Albernos and salute the inaugural class, uh, Visa Salud, uh, Health Promotores, they do great work, they are trusted, um, um, a trusted part of our community, as well as our other minority health initiative partners who continue to help us stay grounded and focus on community and population health and human services. So without further delay, I will turn it over to Dr. Davis and Mr. O'Donnell to lead us through the presentation and public health update this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bridgers. Thank you, Council President uh, Glass and HHS Chair, uh, Council Member Albernaz and the rest of the Council sitting as Board of Health. It is exciting to be before you today. I was last before you in February to talk about opioids and last week marked my six month mark. So you guys haven't run me out of the county yet. So <laughs> happy to be here. The health update today, we are going to the main focus. We're going to give an update on COVID, where we are and our plans for the future. We're going to talk about updates on opioids and mental health. In your briefing packet, you've received additional information on the state of the health of the county. Provided that as background information, but if there is, um, if you have questions about that, we certainly can go into that or other concerns that you might have today. So look forward to your, uh, to your questions. Pleased to also have with us Mr. Sean O'Donnell, who is the acting deputy chief health officer. So glad to have him on the team. So you can go to the next slide. And so we are going to give yet another COVID-19 update. And long story short, I. I'm cautiously optimistic that this may be the last time that the COVID-19 update is the first thing that we talk about in our public health updates. So things are looking really well. If you go to the next slide, you can see um, this is the seven day moving average of case rates for COVID and it goes all the way back to 2020 as that's where that beginning dot is and that end dot where you see the, the red triangle was as of last week. Um, and you can see our, our case rates are much lower but I look at this with, a, with an eye of caution. So this is based on PCR testing. And as we know, as COVID becomes less of the topic that everyone's concerned about, people are less likely to test, um, especially to get a PCR test. And so they're moving more towards getting, uh, doing home antigen tests, which aren't reported as reliably as the PCR testing. And so with that, we have to continue to look at other ways um, to make sure that we are staying on top of things. But I will say it is exciting to see that our current daily average is less than one case per 100,000 people. So that is exciting. When you look at the, this slide, we look at hospitalizations. So hospitalizations is really um, our best harboringer of how much is COVID affecting the community? Are our hospital beds full? Are our ER beds full? Does our ICU have capacity? And as you can see, our rates of COVID-19 hospitalizations are also quite low right now in Maryland and Montgomery County. Um, and this can be more reliable in terms of what is the current situation in terms of how much is COVID affecting the community? Is it keeping people from being able to do their regular routine or are they stuck in the hospital? And what we're finding right now is that hospitalization rate is low. You can see total uh, occupied COVID beds is just 69 across the county, only 11 folks in the ICU. And we've had several days in the last few months where we had no patients with COVID in the ICU, which is something to be celebrated. You can go to the next slide. So overall, you can see that our COVID-19 hospital admissions is low. Our um, PCR testing continues to be quite low. And so we're continuing to monitor through uh, wastewater and syndromic data, uh, which is more helpful when we have lower incidence. Um, I will say that COVID is low, but it's not zero. And you all probably still know somebody right now who has COVID. My cousin called me this week and she's like, I've got COVID. It's still there. It is still driving hospitalizations. It's still driving death. It is still more deadly, more contagious, and uh, causes more disability than the flu does. And so we continue to be concerned and we continue to monitor um, and using things like wastewater surveillance, surveillance and other tools uh, to make sure that we keep an eye on it. I do wanna note that the highest proportion of documented cases continues in to be in those who are older than 35. Um, and from what we are seeing documented in non-Hispanic whites. 
Also important to note, the most severe cases continue to be in those who are either unvaccinated completely or who have not received boosters. And so we continue to see the efficacy and importance of getting the COVID vaccine booster in, um, in terms of preventing severe illness. Let's wait for uh, all, all the presentations and then we'll, we'll do Q&A. So if you wanna send me a message and we'll get you in the queue. So part of uh, Montgomery County's success in COVID has uh, a lot to do with our high rates of vaccination. So as of mid-May, more than 95% of the county residents had received at least one dose of vaccine. 35% had received a, uh, the bivalent booster. And we continue um, to you know, push vaccination. The efforts for distribution will shift in the fall to really focus on underrepresented communities. Um, and folks who are underrepresented in the current uh, booster rate. If you look at the graph on the bottom, you'll see when you look at folks who are over 50, um, while there is some disparity, racial disparity in uh, vaccination rates, it's, it's not that much. It's really in that 18 to 50 age range where we see the greatest racial disparity in vaccine uptake. Um, and then when we look at our pediatric population, we see that the vaccine vaccination rates have not been that great at all. And so continuing to push that in our pediatric population, especially as we will enter into another school year in the fall, um, which I expect to be uh, more normal. So no masks and, and full access, and we wanna make sure that our kids are protected both for themselves, but also to prevent the spread to teachers and older adults that might be in their home. Next slide. I think another thing that it's important to, to, to note um, is that with vaccines widely available uh, in 2022, DHHS in private practice, at pharmacies, DHHS was able to really focus our vaccination efforts on those who are most vulnerable and those who may not have had the same type of access to a private physician or to a pharmacy. And you can see the benefit of that action. So um, while our vaccinations were, rates were good overall, our black and brown populations were more likely to receive that vaccination from a DHHS site. And a lot of that is in uh, a testament to our partnerships with the community. The Asian American Health Initiative, Latino Health Initiative, African American Health Program, Salud Vienna Star, the Black Physicians Healthcare Network, all of these organizations over the last few years have really been an extension of us and really uh, conveying that community trust going to community events, to churches, to community centers to really help extend um, our vaccination efforts, in addition to partnerships with MCPS to be able to provide those vaccinations in schools. For the fall, DHHS will continue to focus on our underrepresented communities. Uh, for the fall, in terms of continuing to monitor, uh, we will continue to provide home test kits. Um, again, PCR testing is less indicative of the uh, population level disease. And so we continue to use wastewater surveillance, um, which provides additional community level tracking. Um, we are expanding our wastewater surve surveillance capabilities. In addition to COVID-19, we'll also be using it for Candida auris, which is a multi-drug resistant, um, uh, very severe fungal infection. Hepatitis A, which is a, um, viral infection that um, is spread through the fecal oral route. There is a vaccination for it that's available. So knowing where those pockets are allows us to target vaccination. Um, and we are also exploring illicit drug monitoring through wastewater um, for opiates and other, uh, and other uh, drugs. So I wanna shift gears a little bit here to talk about opioid use and response. So we came before you back in February and talked a lot about um, opioids, especially in youth. So I wanna give a little bit of an update on where we are with that and kind of steps towards the next direction. So I'd like to remind council of the really framing this bigger problem. So the opioid conversation, misuse, fentanyl, is really just the tip of the iceberg as part of a broader um, issue around mental health, depression, anxiety, and we'll see some of that play out in some of the uh, county health data as well. And in addition, you know, while opioids and fentanyl is the tip of the iceberg, we need to make sure that we are targeting all, all aspects of that and not only focusing on uh, just opioids and fentanyl, but really thinking about the broader mental health issues that are a part. So we have seen um, increased misuse of opioids in the county. This graph is showing uh, opioid-related emergency visits. The one on the left is 
any uh, connection to opioids, and the one on the right is specifically opioid-related um, uh, visits. And the five-year trend is showing an increase in opioid-related uh, emergency department visits. There's been a 20% increase in ED visits from 2022 to 23. Um, there was a 14% increase from 21 to 22, and a 13% increase from 20 to 21. Um, I will note, just as we're looking at the next slide, that this um, this is a fiscal year calendar, so we are at the end of the fiscal year now, so those FY23 numbers are, are just about final uh, for the year. When we look at the next graph, I will just say that these are calendar year numbers, and so when we look at the 23 numbers on this graph, we are only halfway through the year. Um, and so we had noticed since about 2012, with the exception of 2018, this gradual increase in opioid use uh, with a spike in highest rates in 21. And then in 2022, we saw a pretty dramatic decrease in opioid use. Um, and while it might appear that that decrease uh, continues in 2023, I again want to remind you that we are only halfway through the year. And while we've had about 45 cases of um, uh, opioid uh, deaths, that is more than half of what we saw in, uh, uh, in 2022. I'll also bring your attention, so the orange line is opioid deaths and the blue line is fentanyl deaths. And so when you look back, uh, you know, pre-2018, there was a big gap between opioids and fentanyl. And when you look for the last three years, fentanyl has really eclipsed the opioid market. Um, and so really almost completely, any the deaths that we are seeing related to opioids are related to fentanyl. go to the next slide. We are also seeing an increase in youth opioid related deaths. So the gray bars are, um, I'm sorry, uh, related ER visits. So the gray bars are all ER visits related to opioids and the purple is the proportion of that that is um, for folks under 21. And you can see that increasing proportion there. Um, part of that trend um, there's been a shift in the market. So whereas we used to see the youth that were using opioids, it tended to be prescription opioids that they stole out of the medicine cabinet from their parents and grandparents. They were Percocets or other pills that they were using. Now we are seeing a shift that they are going straight to fentanyl and illicits uh, in the market that they are getting on the black market. These are things, these are typically not things that are, that they're finding in the medicine cabinet, which has caused us to shift our, um, shift our direction. So. Whereas our initial messaging was really around um, how to keep medicine safe and how to dispose of them safely, now it really is more around don't start. If you start, go slow, messaging around the dangers of fentanyl. Um, and we recognize that mental health challenges uh, may promote self-medication. So we are seeing some kids who are looking to fill a void um, and looking to um, medications and illicit drugs to fill that void. So I want to remind folks of our uh, public health approach to preventing opioids. So primary prevention, which is around education awareness. How do we get people to not start in the first place? Making sure that we are teaching kids resiliency skills and how to uh, adapt and, and taking advantage of peer networks. Secondary prevention, which is really around harm reduction and treatment. So for those who are at high risk or using or have already started, making sure that they have treatment options available and, and that we can help connect them to that. And then tertiary prevention, which is around overdose reversal. A lot of that is around Narcan treatment, uh, making sure that folks understand how and when to use it. And then in the uh, unfortunate event of, a, of an overdose that results in a death, supporting folks with grief and loss support. So I want to talk a little bit about teen mental health and substance use disorder. Um, again, this is talking about the bottom of the pyramid. How are we trying to increase resilience amongst our youth, um, those before they have even started to use, um, use drugs? So we've reached more than 5,000 youth with the Adolescent Substance Use Prevention Program. Um, this uses evidence-based, the Botvin Life Skills Curriculum. It is highly interactive and curriculum and skills-based designed to promote positive health and personal development for youth in high school. Um, it seeks to assist youth in developing personal management skills, general social skills, and drug resistance skills. Currently, this program is only in our high schools. Um, 
we are looking to expand it so that we can uh, start to expand this to our middle school students as well. Um, and we are working to build capacity so that we can also reach all of our high school students. There's also the Be The One social media campaign. We've gotten over 70,000 impressions, and it really works to educate adolescents, young adults, and families about mental health and substance use, teaching the five steps of Be The One, helping a friend, making sure they know that help is available, and working to keep them safe. It promotes the use of 988 when someone's in, someone is in need of support, and you can see this is a sample Instagram post. And we have seen uh, this be effective um, in some of the overdoses that we have seen from our, from our teens this year. Um, while it's unfortunate to see an overdose, we were happy to see that the friends stepped in and did what they were supposed to do. They gave Narcan, and they supported that, um, that student, that, that friend, until um, the, the uh, fire and rescue were able to arrive. We also are exploring increased capacity for adolescent substance use uh, disorder treatment in patient beds. So we talked before that the, about the lack of uh, beds available for, um, for adolescent youth. And so we have been in multiple conversations with the state as well as conversations with um, our other counties, uh, local health officers about options. And so while we aren't ready to discuss the details of that, there, there are some conversations about being able to open, something, open up something uh, rather quickly, and so we are excited about that. Um, we also have provided treatment funds for uninsured clients, um, recognizing how important it is to be able to get folks into treatment. When somebody is ready to go, we want to make sure that they are able to go and get there. Um, I, along with Luke Hodgson, chair the Opioid uh, Intervention Task Force that is tasked with um, distributing the opioid restitution funds, and we are using those to help expand resources and coordination that will also be coming uh, before council soon, if not already, uh, to approve that budget. And so I also want to address harm reduction. Um, the graph on the left, you can see this is where Narcan has been distributed, where we have uh, firm um, reports from, fire, from EMS. I will say that this is less re reliable data now because more folks have it available in the community. Uh, our harm, pre uh, harm prevention folks have trained over 4,500 individuals on how to use Narcan, and it distributed over 8,000 kits. Uh, they have served over 300 individuals through syringe services programs, distributed over 4,000 fentanyl test kits, and they are using heat maps for targeted outreach to communities to make sure that naloxone is getting into the places where we need it the most. And again, that's an opportunity for our wastewater surveillance to be able to identify targeted areas to make sure that we are putting prevention efforts in the places that need them the most. Um, more community organizations have become overdose response programs. So. Um, Initially, DHHS was the only place that could provide Narcan to, to individuals now. MCPS has taken that on, EMS, and several other organizations um, have become ORPs, and so they are able to get Narcan and distribute it to the community. And these are just a few examples of the community awareness campaigns. Um, the Go Slow campaign educates on the dangers of fentanyl and encourages people to get help for opioid disorder. It's been seen on TV, streaming, ride on buses, bus shelters, and social media. The More in Common campaign reinforces that regardless of our path in life, we have more in common and that anyone can be impacted by mental health or substance use disorder, and it's okay to talk about it. The Drug Take Back campaign aims to bring awareness to the dangers of prescription drugs and how to dispose of them safely. The Good Samaritan Law campaign educates the community about the Good Samaritan Law, which protects individuals who are actively uh, assisting someone in a medical emergency. And the Anti-Stigma campaign, which aims to educate about the various ways people can, uh, can find mental health or substance use treatment. You may have even started to hear on the radio or on Spotify our ads targeting Latino youth around the dangers of fentanyl. Uh, this is in conjunction with LHI, our Latino Health Initiative partners that have uh, purchased these spots and have been really effective in reaching into our Latino youth community. So future steps, um, in addition to increasing the availability of Narcan training, um, we will continue to increase availability of Narcan distribution through our community partners. Um, DHHS internally has uh, convened a work group, a uh, cross-department cross, uh, work group, uh, to make sure that our messaging is consistent. 
Uh, the Latino Health Initiative has been working on a public education campaign that I just mentioned, um, and behavioral health continues to gather evidence on the impact of opioids. We continue to uh, work with our community partners, such as Montgomery County Prevention Alliance um, and um, Montgomery Goes Purple on our drug coalition efforts. So I will end there. Um, take questions. You guys have additional information in your packet. If you want to go into that, we can go into that and uh, open it up for the conversation. Dr. Davis, I appreciate that. Uh, a number of colleagues do have questions, but let me just ask uh, procedurally from you all, do each of you have a presentation or do you want to just, no, we're good. Okay, so this is the end of the formal presentation. Uh, we will begin questions. Let me um, first, uh, state my appreciation for all of that information. Um, you know, uh, Councilmember Albernaz uh, alluded to the evolving nature of these briefings. Um, clearly during the pandemic, um, these were very regular briefings that we had, uh, but uh, prior to that as a member of, former member of the Health and Human Services Committee, um, these were much smaller affairs. Uh, and it was basically a briefing with the, with the committee itself and I remember they were some of the most illuminating conversations because they, uh, the, the information presented pre-pandemic um, showed us what could come, what did come. And now that we are armed with this information, we have to do everything we can to keep everybody healthy and safe. And in looking at the, the presentation, um, Dr. Davis, you know, I want to pick up on the opioid and fentanyl um, epidemic that is out there, particularly as it relates to um, uh, youth abuse um, and incidents there. And uh, knowing that the Narcan training has been uh, incredibly well received, it has been a very popular conversation um, and presentation, the trainings that MCPS, that DHHS have provided. The map that you showed uh, regarding, I, I think it was the Narcan in particular, one of the last slides, um, something stood out to me from that because while most of the heat maps, and this goes back to the HHS conversations, most of the heat maps share with us where the healthcare disparities exist. We know they're in the, the greater uh, Gaithersburg area down through Aspen Hill, Wheaton into Silver Spring and to Tacoma Park. That tends to be the arc. Uh, but in that particular uh, graph graphic, it showed that there was more prevalence up county as well. Uh, in uh, in the, the Clarksburg and Damascus areas. And can you um, share with us why th those areas uh, are now uh, prevalent on, on this heat map? I think it just it speaks to the, the fact that opioids and fentanyl are everybody's problem. Um, I think before you were we were really seeing that around that 270 corridor um, and we are we have really seen that dramatic spread. Um, while we have it has been brought to our attention of many of the concerns in the Latino community. This is everybody's problem and we have seen there is not one high school that hasn't been impacted, there is not one community that hasn't been impacted. And so I think um, maybe a year ago there was a perception that this was just one group of people's problems and I think what this heat map shows is that this is everybody's problem. That's right. I agree with that assessment which is why the all hands on deck approach and going out into every community uh, and informing parents and students uh, about the problems and perils uh, with, with these drugs and uh, on the flip side, how to help people in need in crisis, I think is really important. So I, I appreciate those outreach efforts. Uh, with that, I'll start turning it over to colleagues and we'll lead with the chair of the Health and Human Services Committee. Thank you. There's so much we could talk about, but we don't have all day, unfortunately. So I'll just concentrate on a couple of different issues. Um, the first is, and I had COVID in April for the first time. So uh, your, your comments really resonated, but I, I was fully vaccinated. And so it was not, um, it wasn't a challenge. Uh, it, it just a couple of days had a high fever, not a high fever, but a fever wasn't feeling great. Um, but I do think reinforcing where we are with our general public on the importance of vaccinations is important. Uh, the fatigue is obviously it's beyond fatigue at this point. It's like a numbness. Um, and so 
I, I think that we have to, because on the horizon, who knows what's next? And I think there has been, unfortunately, now, once again, during the presidential election cycle, there's a candidate who's very significant part of his platform is, is discussing vaccinations and spreading this information um, that makes things difficult for us on the ground. So could you talk a little bit about uh, some of the efforts and you mentioned some of them during the presentation, particularly the health promotor is going more one on one, more directly into communities. Um, but what are some of the other communications efforts that we're going to continue or maybe expand? So, so I'll first start by saying there are several examples in, in your background materials that just point to the science that vaccines work. So you can see it in our COVID numbers. There's also information around measles. Um, so we had a measles case a few weeks ago, our first case in five years that did not spread because everybody around them was vaccinated. Um, and there's a slide in there that shows um, how significant the impact of vaccines are for measles. Also, there's a slide in there around MPOX. Um, and while Montgomery County has, eh, we're kind of middle of the road um, in terms of the number of cases, we have the highest rate of vaccination. And I think, again, that speaks to the fact that because folks are getting vaccinated here, we aren't seeing those same rates of MPOX um, in Montgomery County. And so, again, I go back to the science, and I know not everybody believes in science, but I believe in science, and, you know, again and again showing the evidence that vaccines do work and make a difference. Um, but again, it goes back to our community partnerships, and I think the success that we've had around vaccines is not because somebody from the government said, hey, I'm here with a vaccine, let me stick a needle in your arm, it's because somebody that they trusted said, I got this and I believe that it works. And so again, it's the Promotoras, it's our Black Physicians Healthcare Network, it's you know, our Asian American Health Initiative. It's really, we are building on their trust um, in going out to, into the community and um, uh, really creating that, that network of folks who wanna get the vaccine. In terms of our vaccine efforts, I will just give you previews of coming attractions. So I think many of you have heard that there will be a fall booster that comes out. We're expecting probably sometime in the August, September time, time frame for that new fall booster to come out. Um, and there will be a push again to try and get those, uh, get that out into the community. At DHHS, our focus will be on those folks who are not going to pharmacies and don't have access to a primary care doc. And so again, it'll be at our clinics and, be, and working with our community partners to get to those folks who may not have access otherwise. I appreciate that. Okay. Oh, Mr. O'Donnell. I just wanted to add that about, we, we have some of the same questions. Why uh, did the overwhelming number of people get the original COVID vaccinations? And then we saw a bit of a drop off when it came to boosters particularly this past year with the bivalent booster. Uh, a few weeks ago, we conducted a door-to-door -door survey campaign. Mm -hmm. We went to a few hundred homes um, and we wanted to ask people, what resources are they using? What are their concerns? If they got vaccinated originally, but did not get the booster, why not? And we think it may be different within different populations within our county. Um, and so we're, we're gonna take that information to help us craft the next outreach campaign. I appreciate that. Um, this is a left-hand turn, not part of the presentation, but during the winter Maryland Association of Counties conference, there was a lot of discuss regarding the legalization of cannabis and its impact from a public health um, infrastructure standpoint. And there was a lot of concerns raised by public health officials across the state um, regarding how and when uh, things will specifically be implemented. There are lessons learned from other states that have um, gone ahead of the state of Maryland. And I'm not disputing the legalization. I think uh, we're, we're past that conversation now. It's just how can we as a community be prepared? In some of the states where there has been legalization, there were significant rises in emergency room visits among children who were eating edibles. Um, and so what are we doing? Uh, how are we planning for ensuring that there is as smooth a transition as possible to what is a very significant policy uh, direction change? That's a great question. Legalization happens July 1st, so that's that's coming very soon. Um, so we've been working in conjunction with the county executive's office, with police, with human resources to really address all of these. There's a um, uh, public uh, information officers are working on a campaign that I believe launches today or this week around the, you know, 
fact versus fiction. I'll be um, with uh, Lorna on the on her radio broadcast this afternoon to talk about it from a medical perspective, um, really dispelling some of the myths. Just because marijuana is legal doesn't mean that it's any safer than it was yesterday. And so there are, while there are some medical benefits related to cannabis, there are also a lot of medical harms that are related to cannabis, just like there are with excessive use of alcohol and excessive use of uh, tobacco. And so we want to make sure that that message is really clear. We, there's also information that is coming through from the state on their kind of campaign amongst the health officers. So we are piggybacking, piggybacking on those messaging as well. At Summer Mako, uh, the health officers are going to be leading a session when Reefer meets the road um, to talk about some of the um, health implications and some of the, the implications of le cannabis legalization. So you will start to hear this week and following probably throughout the summer more media campaigns around what's true, what's not, um, and how we can really uh, get that message out. So yes, I agree. It's, it's a really important issue. And I think especially around the child piece of making sure that things are in containers, uh, that gummies are not, um, you know, that they are not labeled, that they don't look like candy, um, and how we're making sure that we are keeping our kids safe and away from that. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, we'll have a feature session in the HHS session, uh, just talking about you know how to how to do this with efficacy and and do it well here in our community and what additional resources you might need to make sure that's successful. Um, final is just a comment. Um, we're, we're doing some. We've had some really exciting conversations about addressing some of the barriers to accessing our public health infrastructure. Transportation being a big one, um, and so I look forward to those ongoing conversations and maybe even piloting some initiatives later this year. Um, that will help improve the overall quality of public health in our community. Thank you. I yield back to you, Mr. President. Thank you very much. Uh, Councilmember Mink. Thank you. Um, thanks for that pre presentation. And just want to say, as somebody who was not on the council, obviously, previously, to my deep thanks and appreciation um, to all of you at, at HHS and also to my colleagues who really who predated me and to, and to the county executive who um, helped me and my family and my neighbors uh, be state safe and, and stay as safe as possible through a really, really difficult time. Um, and uh, I, I just really I, I am so grateful to live here in Montgomery County where we are willing to face unpleasant realities, willing to be proactive instead of reactive, willing to make database decisions. Um, and that made our results here uh, so much better than almost anywhere else in the country. So uh, truly my gratitude to everybody here who, who came before me and, um, and really set us on the right path. Um, wanted to note that um, obviously, you know, as we're seeing reflected in the presentation, things are changing. Um, but um, you know there still are risks related to related to COVID, obviously. Uh, but those are a, a little different than they once were. We're looking at um, long COVID, um, increased risk for cardiovascular issues, other consequences that that are kind of secondary and that may or may not be recorded as being related to COVID. But the research more and more is showing that those trends are likely increasing because of, you know, as a result of COVID. Um, and so just wanted to uh, hear about, think about how we um, make sure that the way that we're looking at and understanding the data is reflective of those kind of new trends and new concerns. Um, you know, we're less likely to see, you know, people who are in the hospital because they are acutely sick with, with the COVID that they have just gotten. But how are we looking at the results of COVID and making sure that, uh, that we're going to be able to handle that later on down the road um, and that we're doing whatever we can to keep those later rates down? Any thoughts on that? You know, it's a great question. So I think there's, there are lots of sequelae of COVID that we are only just now starting to understand. And we probably won't fully understand for another 10 or 15, 20 years, really. Um, there is long COVID symptomatology, right, that is directly related to that um, and have been in partnership with some of our other local health departments that are exploring that and the impact on, on the community and how we can um, uh, further understand what that illness looks like. I think even amongst the um, physician and medical community, we are still trying to understand what exactly is long COVID, how do you mark it, how do you, uh, what are the markers for it, how do you treat it, how do you diagnose it, and so that is an ongoing conversation, I think, in the health community. But even beyond that, um, there is a lot of care that didn't happen during COVID, 
people didn't go for their cancer screenings. They didn't get their mammograms, their pap smears, their colonoscopies, their lung cancer screening. And so part of the worry is those cancers are going to show up later and more severe. And so there are outreach efforts around how are we making sure that we are pulling people in and getting their cancer screening that they may have missed during that time. There's also impacts around cardiovascular and chronic disease. So we know that COVID uh, folks who have uh, chronic conditions like diabetes, hypertension, heart failure, were more at risk for getting COVID. And we know that the complications of getting COVID are more severe on that population. And so um, how we are working together with the health community. So I um, uh, sit on the board of the Montgomery County Medical Society as an ex officio member because of the Board of Health. So that creates an opportunity to really connect with the medical providers in the county and really thinking about how are we getting ahead on some of those preventive me measures. Um, there I will highlight a community group that is working to distribute uh, blood pressure cuffs to the African American community and partnering with other physicians on education um, around the dangers of blood pressure. And I think it is efforts like those um, that continue to help us um, stay ahead of, of really what we need to do. I will also highlight kind of previews of coming attractions. So in the fall, we will be reviewing the community health needs assessment that goes dives a little bit deeper into um, the kind of state of affairs of uh, chronic diseases in the county and, and some of the things that we're doing for that. So previews of coming attractions for that too. Great, thank you. Yeah, that's helpful. I want to make sure that as we're messaging to the public, um, that we're not you know, sending the message that we don't have that we don't have COVID-related concerns. Um, they're just they're different now, of course. And so, you know, when we look at that the PCR graph, that you know, I mean, I don't know how much meaning that really has anymore. And we're seeing, of course, similar trends in, in the wastewater, but kind of diving into the details there tells more of the story about spread and being able to see, you know, the, the smaller breakdowns there about, you know, where are we going up and where are we going down and so on might be more helpful for being able to understand the trends on the ground. Um, but also looking at, you know, cardiovascular outcomes and, uh, and, and some of these other issues, longer term issues as we're seeing them pop up might help us to understand the, the risks that we're facing and the risks and, and for the public to understand um, uh, you know, why they should still get vaccinated. And because I think, you know, as we look back, as I was just noting on our success as a county here and coming through the eye of the storm and seeing our rates were, were so much better here than anywhere else, we have kind of, I think, the next horizon ahead of us where 10 years from now, 20 years from now, there's going to be rates that we're going to be looking at across the country of cardiovascular deaths and, you know, and other and other things. And we want our rates for that to be much, much lower as well. At the, you know, in the future, we're going to have a better understanding of how that was connected to, you know, to COVID. Um, but we want to make sure that we are doing everything we can to keep <laughs> to keep our, our those numbers low. And so just want to make sure that we still have a, a sense of urgency around this issue that feels so much less urgent, you know, and I include myself in that. It's hard, you know, we have to be um, very rational about it uh, because the feeling there is, is gone. It's harder to get people to get their boosters now. So um, just thinking about how we can change our messaging to be more reflective of those present day concerns. Um, and also shifting from, you know, it's gonna be hard to get people to get their boosters every single time. Um, we need to make it part of people's routine, part of their kind of normal health care. I see you nodding, you're already thinking about this. Part of their, part of their normal health care, uh, regular routine, um, because we can't just show up there in, you know, in, in white coats at pop-ups. People are, are not going to take that seriously at this point. Um, so how do we, and this is for us, of course, as a council also to just think about, you know, what we can do systemically to help make this just, you know, the, the next measles so that, um, or, you know, or whatever makes sense, but so that down the road, again, we are in a, a better place. And this is going to affect, I think we're going to, we're going to see effects from those long-term health issues that are economic, putting burdens on people's healthcare systems across the country. It's going to affect uh, the workforce and, and things of that nature. And um, we don't want to, to deal with that here as much as possible. So just thinking about those types of transitions as well. Um, and then, um, one other, oh, I did have uh, one question on the opioid subject. Um, and just thinking about how, how do we measure success of the different awareness campaigns? So we, there's lots of different messaging, lots of different types of um, uh, marketing messages. Uh, you noted that the commercials have been really uh, effective at, at reaching into the Latino youth communities. I'm just wondering, how are you measuring success? How are you deciding where to invest more or, or less? 
trying to measure success in media campaigns is difficult, and I, w I will leave that to the experts. I know that we're following impressions and, um, you know, how many was this seen by and some of the surveys that we've done, um, you know, looking at that. It is hard to make a direct correlation between a commercial and, you know, did For that sure. drive behavior. Um, it is also difficult to see success in the short term for something like this. And I think everybody wants to say, you were here in February, our opioid rates half of what they were since then, they are not. Um, and it is a, this, this problem didn't happen overnight and it won't go away overnight, but I will tell you that we are working, you know, tirelessly. I think I'm in an opioid meeting probably every day um, to really get a handle and get under control. Uh, we see the urgency. Um, in the community and are pulling all levers, whether that's social media campaigns, radio ads, TV ads, reaching into the community, one-on-one -on -one conversations, working with our mental health providers and, and treatment programs to really make sure that we are hitting all angles. Yes. Yeah. I just wanted to add, one of the significant improvements we've had in the past year was uh, the use of syndromic data, hospital data. We, we utilized a system that was set up to do bioterrorism surveillance, and we've added algorithms to identify self-harm, to identify opioid use, the data we shared with you today. The great improvement on that is it's near real time. It's ye yesterday, it includes people who went to the emergency department yesterday. It's not perfect because it, it's looking at specific keywords, um, but it does significantly help us to see if interventions are having an impact rather than waiting six months for data, we can see it more immediately. And also, Council Member Meek, just to add, Dr. Davis um, pointed this out earlier in a presentation back in January, February timeframe, we actually convened uh, Helping Human Services All Hands on Deck meeting to look at not only a opioid campaign, but the relationship across the county the other partners that we have, the impact, um, whether or not lessons learned from COVID, uh, for example, the hub and spoke, how we could get deeper in the community, as Council President Glass noted from the heat map, that it's throughout the county, across the county, in ways mm -hmm. that we can connect with our community partners and increasing um, not only uh, from a campaign standpoint, media campaign standpoint, but also um, a community trust level standpoint, getting more folks involved and so we continue to revise that evaluate its effectiveness and move on from those lessons learned to leverage more connection to the community thank you um have you used any um youth social media influencers to to reach that the young our younger population by any chance thank you again for that uh question council member Meek. so we've been working with our children youth and families and our positive youth development street outreach network to look at the most effective approach to reaching those individuals that may our youth in particular and so we are expanding and we have a weekly meeting um, hhs meeting collaboration meeting just to look at those media campaign points so yes we are using and expanding that and looking at other partners in the county or across jurisdictions as dr um, Davis no, noted to look at best practices. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Councilmember Brink. Uh, Councilmember Ludke. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, a quick question, a couple questions, but uh, one about the slide on Narcan administration. Is that data um, incident based, tracked, person based, tracked, or do you have both? So, for example, if you've had 100 occurrences in a 60 day period of Narcan administration, are you able to tell whether that data is repeat or individual instances of, of different people? I believe this data is individual instances. Okay. So okay. there may be, I'm sorry, so there may be repeats within there. Um, so it's individual administration. In, right. Right. And, and one thing to keep in mind is uh, Narcan can be the first thing administered on contact. It may not be an opioid overdose, correct? But you know, it's a pre you know, precautionary thing, um, uh, you know, just in case. So it's right. not it's not going to show us every single uh, case there. 
I just know that that is something that is certainly uh, a common thread uh, from EMS clinicians across the state that they're often going back to the same addresses over and over again. And so I thought, you know, that kind of data would be useful for um, additional targeting uh, for, th for those for whom this is a, a repeat occurrence. Um, the intoxication deaths that you discussed, um, does that include all substances, uh, whatever caused the intoxication, and is that where in the intoxication is the primary cause of death or whether it is a contributing cause to death? If you can turn your microphone. Yep. These are intoxication deaths only due to opioids or fentanyl. Okay. So where opioids or fentanyl was involved. So there may have been other substances on board. Um, and this is not looking at the entire population of intoxication deaths. So it's not looking at alcohol or um, cocaine, for example. Some of these might be repeat. So you can imagine that mm -hmm. somebody could have cocaine and opioids. Right, yeah. right. I'm asking, there was a, and now I'm trying to remember which paper I read it in this morning, so I apologize. But there was a, 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 a news article that came out today that was talking about studying gun violence, because we've had increased fatal and non-fatal uh, shooting, firearms-related deaths, but the co contributing cause of intoxication, whether alcohol or other substance, um, but it was, I believe, Bloomberg School of Public Health and another, someone in California, and they were studying that um, together as a contributing cause, so that's something that I think would be interesting to discuss further at a, at a later point in time. And then um, the third question I have, and final, I promise, um, also piggybacking off of Councilmember Albernos's discussion uh, related cannabis, um, our laws changed October 1st of 2019. We eliminated the ability to give a civil citation to a minor who was smoking cigarettes, vape, et cetera. Um, at the same time, we've had an increased use in vape amongst our adolescent population as a whole. Cigarettes are not the, not the item of choice. Um, but also in using the vape devices, increased consumption of THC. Um, with increased calls for services to assist our adolescent population with cardiac related issues that come from, from doing that. Um, what I, I know some other jurisdictions have tried uh, dealing with this because you can still be disciplined at school for having engaged in the behavior. Um, it's very hard to, to monitor. Um, but they have used cessation programs as a diversion to traditional school discipline that if you're caught, then you're going to have to go through a cessation program and it involves the parent as well or guardian as well to get that buy-in so that you have buy-in in the home as well. And I wondered if that had been considered here. That's a great question. Um, I don't know that if we have looked into kind of those types of cessation programs. I know that we have done some work with families and how um, families and parents can do a better job of engaging their youth in one, just asking about are they using substances, and if they are using substances, how to talk about treatment in a way that is more likely to get them to go into treatment. One of the big concerns that we've had is our parents feeling like they don't know what to do right. and um, can't convince or force their child to go into treatment. And the families that have gone through that educational curriculum have had a much uh, better success rate mm -hmm. in getting their kids to accept treatment. Yeah, I mean, I know I, I've heard this time and time again in the, in the school safety world, but the parents are initially just really upset, right? Mm -hmm. And what they want, ultimately, the outcome is to have the child be well um, and, to, and to improve the health outcome for, for their child. But, you know, sometimes it's hard if you don't have the tools in your toolkit to understand how to, how to get there. Um, particularly with teenagers. <laughs> Thank you, No, I really appreciate that. Um, have you done any other work related to secondhand cannabis exposure um, or in terms of the now impending legalization um, deadline, um, making sure that we have something in place to help folks understand the facts and um, what the resources are to deal with that if they are unwittingly being exposed to secondhand smoke? really mostly around education, what to do, who to call. Um, these are often going to be kind of landlord tenant issues if somebody is smoking in the, you know, neighboring apartment. Um, so there has, I, there is a campaign that will educate on that. I think our role is to really how to, how to think about that from a health aspect and to recognize that there are health implications. 
Okay. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Stewart. Great. Thank you so much. Um, first, I want to extend my thanks. Um, you know, as Council Member Mink said, many of us weren't here before um, during COVID. Um, and I can say it's having been a mayor during COVID, I just want to say thank you uh, for all the work that you all did. And I'm glad to see us um, at now at this point. Um, I did have a couple, one was sort of a, a logistical thing. Uh, Dr. Davis, you had referred to a larger packet and I'm not sure that's up on the website. I just wanted to double check. I think we only have the COVID one. Um, so I was just. It is COVID one. I, the presentation that we gave publicly ended with questions and then yeah. there's additional slides after that. So I think you still. I'm not sure that's up on the website. I just, it's not, yeah. So okay. I don't think we've received that. Great. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'll just say your confidential aides received a PowerPoint um, okay. about like an hour ago and the website will be updated. Oh, okay. So if we just got it this morning. Okay, great. Um, then uh, that's terrific. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, so two questions. One is, um, uh, th the information about the increased access to um, in treatment um, patient care, that sounds great. I know that's something you're working on, looking forward to updates on that. Um, is there any information you can provide or that you all are working on in terms of thinking about how we can expand care just broadly? Um, I think we've talked about this. Uh, we hear a lot from parents, uh, frankly, about just the long waits um, to get to mental health and behavioral health professionals, how hard it is to find adolescent care. Um, are there any efforts that we're working on um, in the county in that area? So there are more broadly. Um, we just heard, I think there's going to be funding to, and this is more for adults than for kids, but to help um, decrease the, the backlog that uh, Baltimore Therapy Center is seeing. So increased capacity there for adults um, to get their wait list down to zero, hopefully by the end of the year. So that, we're really excited about that. They do both group and individual counseling. And so that's an expansion there. Um, and I, there has been expansion, I believe in CAS, uh, Children and Adolescent uh, Substance Screening to be able to get more folks through the funnel because uh, that funnel was keeping people from being able to kind of connect up through resources. So continuing to work there with our community partners. Um, terrific. And then, um, and this may be in the packet and I apologize for not being able to look at it before we began today. Uh, but given the increase in um, our unhoused population, and that's something we've had conversations about as well. Um, just curious if you could give us any um, quick updates on uh, on that um, this morning. Sure, thank you, uh, Councilmember Stewart, for that. So yes, we we've been looking into that. We've had uh, conversations with our chief of our excuse me services to end and prevent homelessness. We had a meeting on Friday with the Housing Opportunity uh, Coalition with the um, DHCA, and so we are now starting to look across agencies regarding better health outcomes, the impact, rental stabilization, housing stabilization. And so we're putting out a, uh, putting together a plan, a strategic plan that the council asked me about when I had my interview and just looking at how it can span across all of the community. There's some of the policies that we talk about COVID that may have applied during that, um, our response to COVID but now are, don't apply, quite frankly. And so we really need to take a, a deeper look into that and uh, have a conversation with council. And um, that's the short update, but we are having those conversations and we are reaching beyond Health and Human Services to look at the community network of provider and the impact that it's having on the provider, but across not only um, uh, one particular cohort, but adolescent health. We talked about reproductive health and housing for uh, individuals who um, who may have challenges in that space, in an adolescent space, and so we're looking at that. We're also working with the executive branch and um, uh, our Department of General Services to see if there are spaces available to support some of those um, strategic initiatives that are on the horizon. So I'll stop there, but again, the short answer is yes, we're having those conversations, and we're in the early stages of those conversations, and we look forward to having conversations with council about those um, those strategic initiatives. Great. Well, thank you very much for all your work. I yield back. Uh, thank you. Uh, Council Member Katz. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And again, thank all of you 
for doing everything you're doing and continue to do. And, and we also thank those who were your predecessors in this job as well. We don't want to forget them and, and for what they have done for all of Montgomery County. And I did want Dr. Davis to know that Sally and I did receive a booster on, because you said it, so therefore we did it on, on Saturday. And, um, you know, it, it, I, my arm didn't even hurt as much this time. I don't know. So maybe it's just your bedside manner that caused that for me. But, but um, I, I do think we need to talk about the um, Narcan, and you've certainly talked about it to some degree. And, um, but on the Narcan part, the training is very important, and we're so glad that Narcan has, has been developed, et cetera, et cetera. But the fact that we need it is another problem. And, and we certainly want to save lives, but the fact that we are having to save that life, how do we get to the point that that person is not going to be doing that? I mean, I know in some cases they said that sometimes they've had to administer Narcan to an individual two and three and many more times in a, in a week. And so that becomes a, a, a question, and, a, and there's no easy answers, but um, do you know of any jurisdiction that if we copy that this would be uh, something else we should do, that they have different resources or additional resources to what we have? You know what I'm trying to ask. Yeah. Um, so first I'll say Narcan is not the answer to opioids any more than AEDs are the answer to heart attacks. Right. They are not going to prevent other problem. They are just, um, you know, they're keeping us from drowning, but it is not a long-term answer. Um, and so continuing to work on increasing mental health treatment, increasing resiliency, increasing peer networks, helping kids to fill that void that they are looking to fill with opioids and fentanyl is really what's going to be the answer to the problem. And so we are looking, while we um, commend the folks who are using Narcan to save their friends, we wish that that was not the thing that they had to resort to, do, to doing and that they were saving that friend before they started using Narcan or started, before they started using fentanyl in the first place. Um, you know, when we look across the country at other models, one of the things, so the country has gone through several waves of opioid epidemics, right? This isn't the first time there was a Percocet epidemic, and um, this is something new. And if you looked at that graph, just how quickly fentanyl has eclipsed all other opioids. People are going to fentanyl before they're going to heroin. Um, and that has been happening in rapid speed. And a lot of folks, uh, uh, us jurisdictions, we are figuring it out together. Um, there, there are not a lot of, there are some models of what was done in the past, and we are looking at that and, you know, how we have kind of gotten out of opioid problems in the past, but fentanyl is different. How we respond to it is different. One of the things I'll say about the adolescent mind um, is prone to experimentation. They don't really understand risk. Um, and they are prone to try new things that seem dangerous. That's why most teenagers, most uh, Olympic gymnasts and downhill skiers, skiers, and all of those risky sports are young people, right? Because they are prone to risk and don't understand that. Um, that's also why we see a lot of drug use and experimentation in the teenage and young adult years. The danger of opioids and fentanyl is that it is more dangerous, it is more deadly, and it is more addictive than other substances. This isn't like um, experimenting with alcohol and pot. And so that first time room for error doesn't exist for a lot of kids like it did when we were growing up. And so helping kids to understand that risk is really hard when kids don't understand risk. Um, and so really getting into those peer networks, getting into the schools, building that resiliency really has to be part of that strategy. And that's where we're working to do in addition to making sure how you can help somebody who's overdosed. Thank you. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Brewer. Thank you very much. Uh, Councilmember Sales. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you um, to our fabulous health administrator and her team. Um, I'll also echo the sentiments of my colleagues for the leadership um, from our past public health officers and um, our current leadership for um, making sure that we were vaccinated and stayed healthy and carried on some of the best practices that we've learned during the pandemic to um, support our 
minority communities especially. So um, really appreciate the broad overview and given that this is my first um, presentation for um, one of these updates, are we generally going to um, receive just topics of your choice or topics of timely issues or how are the presentations planned and selected um, before? Sure. So this is my first sitting as Council of Board of Health. So I would say we're figuring it out together how we how we're going to do this. Um, we did um, our legislative uh, aide Leslie Fry did submit to Council if there were any specific things that folks wanted to hear about, and so COVID and opioids. Uh, we're at the top of that list, so that's where we focus on, but there is additional information um, in the confidential packet that you'll receive that has uh, more data on the county health rankings um, and county health data trends. And again, the we did not go as much into detail on this presentation on chronic disease because that's coming in the community health needs assessment. Um, I will say there is additional information on um, maternal health and morbidity, morbidity and fetal and infant mor mortality rates that I can send after. It's not, um, did not submit it ahead of time because it's, because it's not for public consumption because the numbers are so small. But if council's interested, I can send that information as well. Yeah, I, I think it would be helpful if we're going to get these regular updates to understand the um, complete health state of Montgomery County. I think that would be helpful. And I know that the um, community health needs assessment is coming. Um, you know, we talk about um, past leadership and um, Dr. Gales produced a very important document um, about the social determinants of health down to the zip code. And this data, this research is probably at least 10 years old now. And so it would be helpful for us to get a full picture of where we're at, are we just monitoring our community's health? Are we monitoring outcomes? Are we going to create benchmarks from this community health needs assessment to uh, make recommendations on how we can achieve optimal health? And so I think in order for these meetings to be more robust and to better guide what we do in our committee sessions, I'm hoping that that's what we'll be able to see. And I know that Dr. Bridgers is um, we're gonna be working together on this strategic plan. So I'm excited to see the beginnings of that document as well. Um, so just wanted to know what we can expect from the community health needs assessment and whether there'll be some benchmarks on there as well. So it does dive deeper. I will just highlight in your packets, there is the community health data trends report that is up, that does exist on the website now, um, as well as our county health rankings. And so there's links to that in the packet. The community health data trends was a mail-in survey that we sent to Montgomery County residents on the state of health. Um, and so some of the highlights of that were 25% of people reported a history of depression. I think that's pretty significant. Um, mental illness was listed as the number one health concern. Um, it also, in that report, talks about some of the things that I think are going in our favor um, in terms of county health. Um, uh, we have low rates of inactivity. We have um, uh, low rates of, of poor eating habits. Um, and so we have you know, low crime. Those, those things really help us in terms of you know, why Montgomery County, yet again, um, is at the top of the, the list for Montgomery County uh, for Maryland health rankings. And so there is information there that kind of gives you the opportunity to, to dive a little bit deeper into that. Um, the, uh, this county health data trends also does dive deeper into um, zip code analysis and uh, racial breakdown, which will also be available in the community health needs assessment that's coming. Okay, all right. And will it also include recommendations? Because as you've identified, risky behaviors identified include the poor eating habits, lack of exercise, and texting and phone use. So I know that there are campaigns targeting opioid usage and, you know, poor eating habits can lead to a myriad of other health challenges. And we know that distracted drivers can impact pedestrians and other drivers. And so 
now that we know what the issues are, how are we working across our departments to uh, make sure that these are addressed? I would say the data trends are really data. That is a, for, for those of us who like to nerd out on data, that is an opportunity to go deep on that. I think the, the additional conversations really come in partnership with you all, the council, and with the community, um, and with the, um, the uh, Commission on Health, of really thinking through, here's where we see the challenges, how do we work together on what those policies are, what those new uh, regulations are, what, the news, what those new laws are, what just needs to be a you know, public media campaign to really get to that next level on moving forward. And so I really welcome the opportunity to work with each of you and you know, the Council on, on Health specifically on where are those top priorities to say, well, where do we want to dig deeper and what can we do together on that? Yes. Okay, looking forward to that. And uh, I've received um, some emails from concerned constituents about the removal of mask mandates in healthcare settings. Um, do we have any data to support the removing these mandates in settings where um, our sick and vulnerable residents um, are not um, going to be exposed to uh, contracting COVID or well, we have data that, that masking does work, and individuals are still welcome to wear masks when they go to healthcare, when they go to shopping. Um, we're following the lead here of the CDC and of the Maryland Department of Health that no longer requires uh, masks in healthcare settings. Um, some healthcare settings may still require masks, and certainly if we hit a certain threshold in Maryland, the recommendation across the state will be to go back to that. Um, but while we're at this lower level of, of incidence and of serious illness, they're letting um, healthcare providers make their own choices with whether or not masks would be required. We've received some of those emails and calls, um, and our recommendation is uh, we know people have um, vulnerabilities that they're concerned about when they, and that's why they're going for healthcare. Um, it's always an option to contact your healthcare provider and asking if an accommodation could be made. Sometimes they'll call you when you're ready for your appointment so you don't have to be in the waiting room. Um, and it, it depends on the setting. Some healthcare offices are very small. Some deal with, uh, I know at Dennis Avenue, we deal with uh, TB in some of our clinics, and so they're more likely to have uh, masks utilized in those settings. And individuals can always ask their healthcare provider when they're in that one-on-one -on -one setting to please wear a mask. And I think all healthcare providers would um, would accept that request. Okay, thank you for that. And one last question: um, Since we last met in February um, to discuss the opioid and fentanyl crisis, um, given that we the importance of prevention, uh, Councilmember Katz asked about this. Um, are we looking at other preventative methods that have worked? I know that once we're in the thick of things, we have the Narcan, we have um, how to administer, but are we also looking at prevention methods that we can replicate here in the county? Certainly, um, and we've looked at a lot of um, adolescent programs, training programs that are in the high schools, expanding those to the middle schools. The Botvin Life Skills Program has been um, very well renowned in being successful in this area, but also expanding our adolescent peer network program so that it's not just kids having to go to adults, but that kids can intervene and interact with each other. So looking at those programs that already exist, how can we expand them, and then looking at what are best practices kind of across the country, really. Um, in terms of prevention efforts. Okay, I'm sorry, I have one more question because um, you know Prince George's County just opened up a facility that's supposed to be for youth struggling with substance abuse and mental health challenges. Um, knowing that there is nothing like that in the state of Maryland, would that be something um, that we should think about having here in the county and how we can help with that? Thank you. Yeah, certainly would be happy to explore that. PG County just named their new uh, 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 health officer, Dr. Levy, so I'm excited to partner with him, and that's certainly something that we'll be exploring together. Thank you, Doctor. Um, I yield, Mr. President. 
Uh, thank you very much to the lead for disparities in public health for those questions and for uh, zooming in uh, for this conversation. Uh, uh, next is Councilmember Balcom. Uh, thank you. Um, and uh, Dr. Davis, we, are, we have just gotten through our six months, so we're all in this together. <laughs> and I think we're all doing a great job. Um, so I appreciate you being here today, uh, as, as well as your colleagues. Um, just a couple things. Um, so uh, on your slide, and I know this was a while back, the, the decrease in, fat, in fatalities, it, do you, you attribute that to the, to the Narcan use, or is that, or, or is that more optimistic? So the decrease in fatalities from 21 to 22, yeah. I doubt that it's related to Narcan. Um, our Narcan efforts really ramped up the end of 2022 into this year. Um, the amount of Narcan distributed this year in 2023 alone eclipses what we did in 22, 21, 2019, mm -hmm. and 2018. Um, so the to the question of is the message getting out there, the awareness and, and messaging is certainly getting out there. I'm not sure what to attribute that decrease in between 21 and 22 to. Was it uh, COVID, people were getting, kind of mm -hmm. coming back into to normalcy? I will say that across the board, when we look at other substances, um, cocaine, alcohol, uh, marijuana, we also saw a similar decrease in 21 to 22 and a similar increase in 22 to 23. So it makes me wonder if there was something in the accounting that happened that year because of COVID that they weren't tracking as okay. well. Uh, thank you. Um, and then just uh, briefly, the, the heat map, um, just notice that uh, Barnesville is highlighted. I think that's an anomaly that, that I think that's zip code based. And um, so it, it when you look at the map, I think it's misleading. Uh, you know, Barnesville's a very tiny community, and I think that's probably Boyd's and, um, and Clarksburg. Uh, so just uh, if people don't, aren't aware of that area, uh, that's a little bit misleading. And then just finally, I think the um, messaging um, about uh, certainly the fentanyl, but also cannabis uh, from the uh, messaging with parents so I'm going to age, I'm going to age myself twice in one statement. <laughs> okay, um, you know the 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 old commercial. Um, you know this isn't your parents. Um, I don't even remember. This isn't your parents' Oldsmobile, right? Um, this is not your parents' cannabis, mm -hmm. and I think that it's and, and similarly with fentanyl. I just think that parents don't, just don't understand the significant risk with fentanyl. And then also from cannabis, um, you know, it's, it's not the same as it was uh, 30 years ago. And I, and I don't think parents understand that. And so I think the messaging uh, really needs to, to focus on parents as well. This is so important for parents, but also important for our older adults who may be seeing legalized marijuana and thinking back to their youth this ain't the same marijuana. Um, it's you know probably five times stronger, and so that messaging really across the board of this is a different strain than what you may have seen earlier. It would be wonderful if we had the same thing happen to fentanyl that happened to the old people. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I thought I thought we were uh, going to talk about uh, Nancy Reagan slogans from the early '80s, yeah, you know, which which already dates others here. Um, but uh, appreciate appreciate those comments. That's that's new. Councilmember Katz says. Um, Councilmember Fani Gonzalez. Can I go very quickly? Um, thank you so much for the partnership. As always, you your entire team has been amazing to work with, and I know we had that meeting in Glenmont tomorrow or something. It's happening soon, so thank you. Um, is there, I was at the Wheaton High School um, Health Center recently, amazing facility, really. Is there a report of, you know, how many people are using all those high school facilities that we, I think all of the high schools are already open with a center, right? Or almost all of them at this point. What's the status of that? You don't know. Yeah, it's it's not all of them yet. I, we're on Almost. we're on pace. Um, I think within the next two years. Uh, so the latest one, I believe, is Kennedy High School, mm -hmm. uh, which will have a school-based health and wellness center. Yes, they they track 
um, the number of students they see, the types of services they provide, and we could certainly provide that at a future date. I yeah, I would love that, and also um, their families, because you can have your siblings, even if you you don't go to Wheaton High School, and you're just speaking that that high school, just because I was there. Um, I mean, having a, a health center in your neighborhood is huge, and it's so positive, and uh, I would love to see that data. So that's one. Uh, and then the second last thing, this I know this is controversial, but I gotta ask you. I I just been getting phone calls, and the last one that I received was just last Thursday, on the restoration center, the mental health center that is being proposed. And I've been getting mixed messages. I, and to be honest, I don't even know where the county stands because at the beginning I thought it was going to be a walking center. Like if you have a mental crisis, you walk in. Now I'm hearing it's going to be by appointment, which is insane. So I'm hoping that you're going to say, no, Natalie, that's not true. So there you go. That's your that's Councilman question. Attorney Gonzalez, I'll take this one and know it's not true it is a diversion center and so the naming convention has changed to speak to such as opposed to restoration center is a stable it is a um, diversion center where individuals who are in crisis who might, may otherwise have to go to a detention center or who need um, mental health or substance use uh, support will um, use this facility. We've had conversations with uh, NAMI and others, so that's not the case. It's still in progress, and so I can provide you with a detailed update. I have a meeting with Dr. Rolando supposedly at 11 o'clock, but that's going to be delayed, so I will provide you with an update this morning regarding the Diversion Center. Thank you so much. Back to you, Council President. We're going to try and get that 11 o'clock appointment on time. Um, uh, appreciate this conversation. Appreciate the clarification um, that was just asked by Councilmember Fani Gonzalez. Uh, and uh, I very much appreciate the comments from uh, all of my colleagues, especially those that are new to the council or have now been here six months, uh, because it seems like it has been a very long time since we've been having these briefings. We've been talking about keeping all of our residents healthy and safe, and we've been speaking specifically about COVID. Um, and the perspectives that each of um, my colleagues and the new colleagues had uh, while, uh, the, before getting to the council, um, and having, having those life experiences inform them that they are now here and fully engaged in this conversation is critically important. So I thank each and every one of you. And uh, Dr. Bridgers, Mr. O'Donnell, um, Dr. Davis, thank you for the presentation. Um, and we will continue this conversation for sure. Thank you. And you can have your 11 o'clock meeting. Okay, colleagues, we are going to move to district council session now um, because we have a zoning text amendment 2303 Bethesda overlay zone extensions uh, that is before us. The Planning Housing Parks Committee recommends approval with amendments. Ms. Ndo is here. I will turn it over to the chair of the Planning Housing Parks Committee, Chair Friesen. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I uh, appreciate it. I think this one is pretty straightforward. Uh, the, the Planning Housing Parks Committee reviewed a zoning text amendment sent over at the request of the planning board that relates to Bethesda Overlay Zone, uh, also known as the BOS. The BOS is unique in the way that it restricts approval validity periods. It's essentially a use it or lose it construct due to the specific cap on density, uh, for those colleagues, you'll recall uh, there's a similar dynamic that was uh, done in Silver Spring as well as part of that uh, master plan. The intent of the BAS uh, is to avoid a hoarding situation where the pipeline gets clogged with projects that are essentially sitting on approvals. Uh, my office was approached about this ZTA originally as the district council member uh, related to Bethesda. Uh, about allowing for an extension for approvals based on certain challenging market dynamics with uh, labor shortages and construction costs and inflationary uh, dynamics. Uh, but I uh, thought it was most appropriate to defer it to the professionals in the planning department and have them assess the need and determine whether or not an extension was reasonable and appropriate and to make a recommendation uh, to the council, which they uh, have done, uh, given the, the variety of uh, market factors. Um, 
I don't believe that the GTA does any harm to the integrity of the Bethesda overlay zone, but it does show some recognition for the realities that these projects currently face. Uh, I will uh, note that uh, there were uh, uh, there was a request from one of the related properties, Washington Property Company, for a two-year period. The planning department had recommended a one-year uh, period, as uh, we did originally. Uh, deferred to the professionals in the planning department that one year seemed uh, reasonable and uh, appropriate. The PHP committee uh, unanimously recommended approval of the measure with one uh, very minor technical amendment that included uh, the language related to an application for a building permit uh, since it was originally drafted uh, as the building permit being the trigger, but really it's the application for a building permit, uh, and that was just the technical uh, amendment uh, and uh, the committee uh, moved for uh, approval of this uh, one-year extension, uh, which was at the request and the recommendation of the planning department and the planning board. So with that, uh, I'll turn it to Ms. Nadu if she has anything to add, but we have a committee recommendation before the body. Nothing to add. There you go. Good report out. Uh, there is a Planning Housing Parks Committee recommendation for approval uh, with amendments. Uh, and not seeing any other comments, Madam Clerk, if you could call the roll. Councilmember Lutfi? Yes. Councilmember Lutfi votes yes. Councilmember Mink? Yes. Councilmember Mink votes yes. Councilmember Sales? Yes. Councilmember Sales votes yes. Councilmember Albernos? Yes. Councilmember Albernos votes yes. Councilmember Jawando is absent. Councilmember Katz? Yes. Councilmember Katz votes yes. Councilmember Stewart? Yes. Councilmember Stewart votes yes. Councilmember Fanny Gonzalez? Yes. Councilmember Fanny Gonzalez votes yes. Councilmember Balcom? Yes. Councilmember Balcom votes yes. Councilmember Friedson? Yes. Councilmember Friedson votes yes. Councilmember Glass? Yes. Councilmember Glass votes yes. And that is approved. Thank you. Um, we are now going to move to the consent calendar, and there are several items on the consent calendar for our approval. But before we go to the consent calendar directly, there is one item, item 3D, that I will need a motion to waive the rules of procedure rule for rule 3 to allow for immediate action. So moved. Is there Second. a motion moved by Council Vice President Friedson, seconded by Council Member Stewart? Uh, all those in favor of waiving the rules? Unanimous by all those present. Um, and with that, is there a motion to approve the consent calendar? Pardon me, Mr. Glass. Yes. Council Member Sales, did you want to vote on that item? I apologize. Yes. I thought I saw her hand. My apologies. Thank you very much, <laughs> Council Member Sales. Uh, and so with that, uh, there's a motion by Vice President Friedson. Second. Uh, uh, seconded by Council Member Ludke. Uh, all those in favor of the consent calendar? And that is unanimous by all those present. Uh, and long list of consent calendar items. So colleagues, we are in need of a motion now to go into closed session to consult with counsel to obtain legal advice pursuant to Maryland Code General Provisions Article 3, 305B7 and 3305B8 to consult with staff, consultants, or other individuals about pending or potential litigation. Topic is pending litigation involving the county. Is there a motion? So moved. Moved by Councilmember Ludke. Seconded by Councilmember Katz. All those in favor? And that's unanimous by all those present. Um, thank you, colleagues. We're going to meet in the third floor for that closed session, but just a quick programming note for everybody who is following. Um, we will go into closed session, and then we will reemerge from closed session because we will have a special proclamation at noon uh, to honor the United States Capitol Police Officer Harry A. Dunn, who is awarded the Presidential Citizens Medal by President Biden, and that is an honor that will be bestowed upon him by Councilmember Fani Gonzalez, and that will be at noon. Uh, and so with that, we'll go into closed session right now. <laughs>